much for joining the call this evening. Uh, thanks very much for uh, joining me this evening. Um, so uh, I won't keep you too long, given how beautiful of an evening it is. Uh, so I'll just take a brief time to talk a little bit about the book. And uh, hopefully it's a topic that you'll find of interest. And um, just before we start, thanks a lot to Deirdre and to the library for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. So basically, just to, give, just to go back to the start again, um, the book is kind of a, a history of Ireland from the oldest fossil evidence, which dates back about half a billion years right up to the present day. Um, it's a topic that's kind of always been of interest to me, and uh, I think it's a, a topic of interest to an awful lot of people, but not a lot has been uh, written on it by way of kind of uh, non-academic writing. So just for a sort of general readership, that was something that I had hoped to do with this book. So uh, it's quite difficult to condense half a billion years worth of history into about a half an hour of a presentation, but I'll do my best. And um, if there's any questions that you might have at the end, I'd be happy to answer them as best I can. So. Just to give some context, uh, we now know that the first people arrived in Ireland about 33,000 years ago. But um, the record of life in Ireland is actually, actually stretches back far, far further than that, hundreds and hundreds of million years into the, into the past. And that's really what I wanted to explore in this book. Uh, during that time, we had some incredible creatures that were living in Ireland, uh, two of which you can scre see on screen there now. Uh, we'll be meeting those a little bit later on and finding out a little bit more about them but uh, also a lot, plenty of other creatures, um, including some quite unexpected ones, which I hope you'll, you'll get to enjoy later on in the presentation. And of course, we still have plenty of uh, amazing wildlife with us today, even if not quite as much as we used to. Despite its small size, Ireland has actually produced some incredible fossil evidence uh, dating from some of the key moments in the history of life. So the fossils of Ireland have yielded some of the first uh, plants that grew on land, some of the first uh, backboned animals to walk on land and some of the first insects to actually take to the wing, which is quite an incredible achievement for such a small country um, with obviously a very limited fossil record to have incredible finds like that to have been made in Ireland is really quite something. So just a little bit about me, I suppose, before we start, um, who am I? No one special really, just someone who has had an interest in wildlife from a very young age, both extant wildlife that we still have with us and extinct wildlife. Um, I spent much of my childhood looking for both, especially for looking for extinct creatures. Um, I suppose I grew up watching programs like Walking with Dinosaurs and Walking with Beasts and seeing the incredible animals that used to live on the planet millions of years before we st uh, stepped foot here. So I really wanted to see what kind of creatures we had in Ireland and what kind of you know, creatures lived here millions and millions of years ago. Uh, I never found any myself. Uh, I left a lot of holes in uh, my parents' back garden, my grandparents' garden in my search for prehistoric creatures. But luckily, uh, other people have had far better luck than I have finding the kind of animals that have lived in Ireland and uncovering our fossil record and piecing together the story of life here. So fortunately, thanks to their efforts, we have a really comprehensive uh, kind of uh, track record of the animals that have lived here and uh, the story of life in Ireland from half a billion years ago up to the present day. Uh, so in this book, I just wanted to kind of use that fossil evidence to tell the narrative of life in Ireland as far back as the fossil evidence will go right up to the present human age that we're currently living in and that we can see and experience all around us. So where does this story begin? Well, I'm a proud Wicklow man myself, so I'm happy to say that it begins within County Wicklow. Uh, some of Ireland's oldest fossils, and at the time they were the oldest fossils known in the whole world, were actually found on Bray Head. Uh, these were trace fossils that were made during the Cambrian period, so around 500 million years ago. So just to put that in context, the, for people who think of prehistory, the dinosaurs, which are kind of the first animals that will come to mind when you think of prehistoric life, they first appeared around 240, 250 million years ago. So the fossils found at Brayhead are twice as old as the oldest dinosaurs, which really puts that in context. Um, uh, just to say, explain a little bit about what a trace fossil is. So a trace fossil is left by the actual activity of an animal in life. So when most people think of fossils, they think of bones, but the fossils that were found on Bray Head were actually little tunnels, uh, burrows that were left by a creature that was still alive, that was obviously alive at the time, but the remains of that creature never fossilized. Uh, the reason for that is because the creature that left them would have been too soft. It would have had quite a worm-like body. It wouldn't have had certainly any solid bones or anything like that that could have been preserved. So all that it left behind were these kind of tunnels of radiating patterns of burrows that it left as it tunneled beneath a prehistoric seaway about 500 million years ago. 
So when these fossils were first discovered in the mid 1800s, they were actually the oldest fossils known in the entire world. So uh, quite a remarkable find. Uh, fortunately, there was more than just uh, trace fossils to go by when we look at uh, the really deep uh, ancient fossils that were found in Ireland. So the, we know now that the seas of prehistoric Ireland were actually home to a very uh, incredible uh, range and variety of creatures. Uh, these included animals called nautiloids, which are basically related to octopuses and squid. They would have looked quite similar to them as well, with a huge bulbous eyes and a ring of tentacles. And they also, they would have had an external shell unlike uh, octopuses and squid as well. So uh, this, this is a feature that uh, squid and octopus subsequently lost but the nautiloids that lived hundreds of billions of years ago had this like a cone shaped shell at the back and that's the main fossil that they left behind. Another creature of course that was found in Ireland was uh, trilobites, one of the most uh, kind of iconic creatures of prehistory. An example of the trilobite you can see on the screen there. This isn't necessarily a fossil that was found in Ireland but trilobites were an incredibly diverse group of creatures. They would have looked very much uh, like wood lice um, but they, were, they would have lived at the bottom of the sea millions and millions of years ago, highly successful group of animals with thousands of different species, uh, ranging from uh, large predators up to half a metre long to tiny minuscule forms that would have been only a couple of millimetres in size, basically microscopic. Um, and uh, so they were highly successful creatures that would have lived at the bottom of the seabed uh, in prehistoric times. Uh, another fossil that was uh, found in County Tipperary were primitive plants that were called Cooksonia. So an example of what Cooksonia would have looked like in life, you can see at the bottom of the screen there. So what was special about these is they were some of the first plants to be found on land. They were also some of the very first plants to have what's called vascular tissue. So all of the plants that you see around you today, like trees, etc., use vascular tissue to kind of transport their, their food uh, through the trunk and up to the leaves. Uh, so this was a hugely important development in the history of plants that helped them colonize dry land. And so Cooksonia are thought by scientists to be some of the first plants to actually possess vascular tissue. And some of the oldest Cooksonia known to science were found on the Devil Bit, Devil's Bit Mountain in County Tipperary. Uh, they doubt dated to about 430 million years ago, which again is obviously incredibly ancient. They're actually tiny fossils. Um, they needed to have alcohol poured on the rock to make them visible, which is how small they were. But they would ultimately help uh, spawn the fauna, that we, the flora rather, that we still see around us uh, today. You know, the incredible trees and flowers wouldn't have been possible without the very primitive uh, plants like this that came before them hundreds and hundreds of, million years, of millions of years ago. Moving on then, this is probably a site that uh, people would, will have heard of. It's the Valencia Island Trackway in County Kerry. Um, so this trackway, as you can see, the footprints in the photograph at the top were left by a primitive tetrapod about 385 million years ago during the Devonian period. So just to explain what a, a tetrapod is very briefly, a tetrapod is basically any backbone creature with four limbs. So that moves on land, basically. So uh, humans obviously are tetrapods, all mammals, birds, uh, reptiles and amphibians will count as tetrapods, including things like snakes and whales, because they would have evolved from a four-legged ancestor. So the Valencia Island Trackway is an incredibly, um, just an incredible milestone in the history of life on Earth because it dates from a time when tetrapods were starting to leave the water and crawl onto land. And that would have set in motion um, the uh, evolution of all of the uh, land animals that we see. So all of the mammals, all of the reptiles, all of the birds, uh, all of them will ultimately descend from primitive tetrapods uh, like the one uh, illustrated at the bottom of the screen there that started to leave the water at this time. And uh, footprints from of early tetrapods are extremely rare in the, in the fossil record. And very few of them are as comprehensive as the 200 or so footprints that are found on Valencia Island. So a very, very important fossil trackway for science. Uh, a landmark moment in the history of life on Earth, as I said, uh, one of the first uh, known tetrapods to have left the water and crawl onto land, just to have left its footprints in case. And the fact that they survived through uh, nearly 400 million years of uh, weathering and erosion is just absolutely incredible. This is one of Ireland's most important fossil sites. And it was actually the oldest tetrapod trackway known in the entire world uh, until a new, slightly newer one was discovered in 2009. So the Valencia Island trackway was discovered uh, in 1993 by a Swiss undergraduate student. There's some debate as to whether it was actually known about by locals on the island before then, but it wasn't formally uh, described by science until the early 1990s. So 
um, if any of you have actually been to the site, it's really not surprising because at high tide, it can be quite hard to find. Uh, if you didn't have signs to point you there, you really wouldn't know where you were going or what you were looking for. But um, so this incredible discovery managed to remain uh, hidden to science for, for centuries until it was discovered not too long ago. So after the Devonian period, which is when the primitive tetrapods were coming onto land, you have what's called the Carboniferous period. Um, so the Carboniferous, which went from about 359 to about 299 million years ago, uh, this period contributed more to Ireland's geological makeup than any other. Um, if you look at any geological map of Ireland, typically you'll see this mass of uh, blue uh, covering much of the Midlands and then um, pouring into the, uh, each of the four provinces. And that's the Carboniferous Limestone, which was laid at the bottom of a prehistoric sea during the Carboniferous period. Much of Ireland would have been underwater. So that rock formed at the bottom of a prehistoric sea from the remains of sea creatures that lived within that sea more than 300 million years ago. Uh, the marine life of the time would go on to form the Carboniferous Limestone, and that's what underpins much of Ireland today. And uh, the, in the photograph there, you'll see a place that many of you have, have probably been to. That's the burn in County Clare. And uh, this is probably the most poetic expression of the Carboniferous limestone that we have in Ireland. Uh, so all the stock topsoil has been gradually stripped away and the limestone itself has um, formed into these magnificent uh, crikes and glints that, uh, that you can see there in the photo. So what kind of animals were actually living in this prehistoric sea? Well, fortunately, they left some evidence behind us. Um, we know now that Ireland's Carboniferous Sea was home to a variety of just absolutely incredible creatures, uh, such as enormous snails and uh, giant tentacled creatures. So, for instance, the, the first photograph there is a giant snail that was found in a wall in Chum in County Galway. So this creature uh, would have lived at the bottom of the Carboniferous Sea, just uh, basically sifting through the mud, uh, getting all the nutrition it needed from, probably from that. But in life, the shell that you see on screen would actually have looked even more spectacular because it would have had spikes running up and down either side of it. And these would have acted basically to prevent the animal sinking into the mud. So uh, this would have been a, a really impressive creature to have seen. Even more so, just to the right of that, you can see um, just how big this shelled creature would have been. This animal was called Rayonoceros. Uh, it was a cephalopod, so it would have been related to cuttlefish, to octopus and to squid. Um, it would have had a huge shell. You can kind of see some of the remains of the shell there. And um, our, the rhinoceros remains that have been found in Ireland, you can see some of them in the Natural History Museum in Dublin and in the Ulster Museum in Belfast, these huge kind of pillars of, um, of shell that have been found in places like County Down. And uh, just the reconstruction there, there just shows what the animal, how big it would have been in life. So at the end of the shell, it would have had these two huge eyes and this ring of tentacles that it would have used to to grab its prey, whether they were trilobites crawling along the sea floor, any fish that it could grab, maybe smaller cephalopods, basically any creatures that it would have been large enough to overpower. And um, sharks would have flourished at this time as well. So sharks are some of the oldest creatures that are in the sea, certainly some of the oldest fish. And during the Carboniferous, they were very, very prevalent. And um, so basically at the uh, end of the Devonian period and at the start of the Carboniferous, you saw some of the older fish groups go extinct. So with the, these kind of, this left a sort of vacancy in the marine ecosystem that sharks were able to exploit. And so you saw the emergence of new types of sharks, like the one that left its tooth there that you could see in the photo there at the bottom. This was a creature that would have been uh, thought by scientists to have been around 70 centimeters long. So not a huge creature by any means, but still a very vicious predator with kind of classic shark shaped tooth that you can just see there. Another very, very impressive find that was found in Ireland's Carboniferous rocks was actually an insect. So, um, so when people think of impressive fossils, not always the it's, size isn't always the most important thing. Sometimes tiny fossils can be really important to science as well. And this is an example of that. So this was a fossil that was found in Doolan in County Clare. Uh, it would have been an insect fossil that would have been about 21 millimeters long. It was one of the oldest flying insects known in uh, fossils that were found in Europe at that time dating to about 315 million years old. What was very interesting about this fossil was that it was one of the oldest examples of an insect that could actually fold its wings back. So the flying insects that existed before then would have held their wings out to the side, much like dragonflies do. But this insect was one of the very earliest known examples of an insect that actually folded its wings back uh, lengthways along its body, uh, just the way bees and uh, blue bottles are able to do today. 
And this was a very, very important evolutionary advantage because it meant that they could get uh, within little nooks and crannies that they wouldn't have been previously been able to exploit. So not only was flight the huge evolutionary advantage, but this would have been the, the cherry on top. So uh, an interesting fossil from the time when creatures took to the wing for the first time. Insects, of course, were the very first animals to fly. And this would have been the oldest known, one of the oldest known insects to have taken to the wing. Um, of course, not all uh, creatures lived on the wing or in the sea during the Carboniferous. Um, on land at this time, there would have been huge coal forests. So the, reason, the very word Carboniferous means coal bearing. And this is because uh, most coal uh, that is mined today actually stems from the Carboniferous period. And uh, coal, as many of you know, probably knows the remains of fossil plants. So during the Carboniferous, you would have, would have had these uh, massive swamp forests known as the coal forests because their remains would go on to form the coal that we have today. But the plants that would have been within them would have looked very, very different from the plants that we had today. So instead of things like oak trees, ash trees, or any of the kind of deciduous trees we have today, you actually would have had enormous club mosses, horsetails, and ferns. These uh, plants would have been much more diverse back then than they are now and much more prevalent. And they would have formed giant forests all of their own. Uh, some examples of the creatures that would have lived in the coal forest back then were found in Castlecomer in County Kilkenny, in the Jarrow Colliery, which is um, obviously a coal seam that, would have, that was mined in the 1800s and produced an incredible array of uh, prehistoric amphibians. So amphibians, for all of you that, that don't know, is the order of creatures that includes things like frogs and newts and toads and salamanders. Uh, during the Carboniferous, they would have been uh, among the much more dominant in ecosystems than they are now. And they would have actually evolved into a lot of forms that reptiles uh, live in, uh, inhabit today. So that's why during the Carboniferous period, you would have seen uh, amphibians like the creature at the top there, called Me which is called Megalocephalus, which uh, looked a lot more, more like a crocodile. Even though crocodiles didn't exist at this time, this creature evolved to look like a crocodile to fill the same niche within its ecosystem. So this was uh, the biggest of the amphibians found in Castlecomer, would have been about a meter and a half long with a skull that would have been about 30 to 35 centimeters long. So a certainly very fearsome predator in and of itself. The creature below it is called uh, Ophidurpidon. It's a, it was also an amphibian, even though it looked very much like a snake. So it evolved, uh, it's, scientists think that it, it lost its limbs so that it could basically tunnel through the decaying vegetation and go into burrows after its prey, much like snakes do today. And the creature at the bottom, is probably one of the most famous uh, of the amphibians that lived in Castle Conwer. It's called uh, Dendropoton, which is um, a very lizard-like creature that would have uh, crawled through the forest, probably lived in uh, the decaying trees, hollowed out for uh, tree ferns that would have been in the, in the uh, uh, Colf swamp at that time, around 314 million years ago. So the, fa the fauna at Castle Comer was actually one of the oldest coal swamp faunas uh, known in the entire fossil record. So very, very important to science. Now, I think probably better known uh, would have been the, uh, the dinosaurs. So obviously the dinosaurs are kind of the superstars of the prehistoric world. And we did actually have dinosaurs in Ireland. Um, one of the problems when it comes to dinosaurs in Ireland is that not a whole lot of uh, rocks from what is called the Mesozoic era or the age of the dinosaurs are known in Ireland. We just don't have a lot of it here. We're a small island. We have a lot more of some rocks than of others. And Mesozoic rocks, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of them. But the Mesozoic rocks that are exposed on the coast of County Antrim have actually produced quite a lot of fossils, among them two dinosaur bones. Um, they date from the early Jurassic period, so around 200 million years ago. So this was actually a very interesting time in the context of dinosaur history because it was when they were starting to really get to, to large sizes and starting to become the dominant animals on land, which they would be for uh, nearly 150 million years after that. Um, Ireland's dinosaur fossils, even though we have only two pieces of bone, dinosaur bone have ever been found in Ireland, they're still very important to science for two reasons. One is that uh, dinosaur bones from the early Jurassic are actually extremely rare in the fossil record. It's a little bit of a uh, blank spot in their history. Uh, the other reason is that they're the most westerly dinosaur fossils known in Europe. So uh, they confirm, you know, that dinosaurs had a more Western distribution in Europe than had been previously known, which is obviously very important in terms of our understanding of the prehistoric world. So the two dinosaur bones that were found are believed to be from two different, uh, different, different uh, species. Uh, one of them came from an armored herbivore, which is called Skeletosaurus. Uh, you can see on the screen there a drawing, a restoration of what Skeletosaurus probably would have looked like in life. It would have been an armored plant-eating dinosaur. So 
about four meters long, maybe a meter tall at the hips, and would have weighed about a quarter of a ton, so around 250 kilograms or so. Um, would have been a rather slow, ponderous plant-eating dinosaur. Uh, probably couldn't uh, chew very well. In fact, uh, early dinosaurs couldn't chew. They didn't simply didn't have the uh, the teeth, the prerequisite teeth to chew food to the extent that we could. So it could, probably could only very cr crudely chew its food. And then it would have used uh, stones within its stomach like a lot of birds do today to kind of grind up the food further. And this is known because a lot of more complete dinosaur skeletons have been found uh, with bones within what would have been their gizzard, which is obviously similar to what birds have today. Um, the other bone came from a, what's called a theropod dinosaur, which is a very broad group. The theropods were basically all of the meat-eating dinosaurs. So your T-Rex, your Spinosaurus, your Velociraptor, all of the famous meat-eating dinosaurs, all of them were theropods. Um, not much is known about the one that was found in Ireland, unfortunately, because uh, it's very hard to uh, discern a species based on one bone. But scientists were able to confirm that it was a theropod. Uh, it would have been probably fairly small for, by dinosaur standards, maybe two or three meters long, though it's not known whether it was fully grown or whether it was an immature dinosaur that would have gotten bigger if it had lived longer. So What's very interesting is that while the dinosaurs were on land, there were also uh, reptiles within the oceans at this time. And in fact, this was very much a golden age of marine reptiles as well. And their remains are actually quite a lot uh, more common in Ireland than dinosaur bones. So whereas we only have two dinosaur bones from Ireland to go on, we have much more uh, complete specimens or uh, uh, rather a lot more bones of the reptiles that lived in the ocean. So what kind of animals were they? So they included creatures like the ichthyosaurs, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. The ichthyosaurs would have looked a lot like uh, dolphins. And the reason for that is because they would have lived very much a similar lifestyle to dolphins. Uh, they were the most um, fully adapted for aquatic life of any of the marine reptiles. So they had a dorsal fin on their back for stability in the water. And of course, a sweeping fish-like tail at the end to help them power through the water at incredible speed. They would have been very, very fast. Active hunters would have used their large eyes to basically track their prey through the water. The other group of marine reptiles that lived in the Jurassic was the plesiosaurs, an example of which you can see is at the top. So some of their fossils have been found at sites like Cave Hill in County Antrim. Um, the plesiosaurs had a very long neck and four flippers, so a very different shape from the ichthyosaurs. Probably wouldn't have been quite as fast, but certainly would have been very elegant in their own right. It's thought that they had a very long neck to uh, help them sneak up on fish within the water. So the reasoning behind this is that uh, if the head, if the with the small head on top of a long neck, it meant that it would have given them, them an extra couple of seconds basically for to avoid um, the fish detecting them in the water to be able to snap at prey. So uh, this would have helped them be highly successful hunters of, of fish at the time. So the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs would have been the dominant marine reptiles around 200 million years ago. Then later in the Cretaceous period, so we're talking about 145 to 66 million years ago, we saw a third family of marine reptiles uh, come to the party and they were the Mosasaurs. And um, the Mosasaurs, in terms of the Irish record, are only known from a couple of vertebrae that have been found in County Antrim. Um, but they were a very, very diverse group of marine reptiles with both very small, four, uh, which ranged in size enormously from creatures that would have been maybe two or three meters long, right up to over 12 meters long. So absolutely enormous. They were very closely related to things like monitor lizards and snakes that we still have today. Um, they would have had, they would have been incredibly, uh, had an incredibly powerful bite, uh, like a lot of lizards do today. It's thought that they also had a forked tongue, which would have helped them track their prey through the water. So a really terrifying uh, group of prehistoric predators that uh, we had in Ireland at the end of the Cretaceous period. So you're talking roughly 80 million, towards the end of the Cretaceous period, rather. so late Cretaceous, around 80 million years ago, give or take. So now just to jump forward in time and enormously, so I'm going to take you from the age of the reptiles, which ended about 66 million years ago, right up to the Ice Age. So just that photo there is in the Gap of Dunlow in County Kerry, which is another place I hugely recommend visiting if you're ever down in that, in that uh, part of the world. This is one of the best examples in Europe of what's called a glacial valley. So this would have been carved out by a glacier that moved through it during the Ice Age and carved out this magnificent glacial landscape uh, many of which you can see around Ireland, including in places like the Wicklow Mountains as well. So just a bit of background. So the age of the reptiles, so with the likes of the dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, 
that came to a, a rather cataclysmic end about 66 million years ago with a, a meteorite striking the earth, an asteroid sorry, striking the earth that caused a mass extinction and all of these groups to go extinct. Uh, what happened thereafter was uh, the mammals, which is the group to which, you know, obviously ourselves and, you know, um, you know elephants, uh, uh, rodents, etc., etc. All of those creatures are all mammals. So what happened after the extinction of the, of the giant reptiles, you saw the rise of the mammals. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of fossil evidence uh, from this particular time period to kind of chronicle the rise of the mammals in Ireland. Uh, we have a rather enormous gap in the fossil record that lasted tens of millions of years. Again, while we have very few uh, rocks from the age of the dinosaurs, we have even fewer from the period that came immediately after. So we can only speculate as to what creatures lived here at that time. It is only from the Ice Age that we find evidence of prehistoric life again. So just for a bit of context, uh, the Ice Age, which is known to science generally as the Pleistocene, began around two and a half million years ago and ended around short, um, around 11,700 years ago or so. So we do have fossil evidence from that time and uh, that's what I'm going to talk you through very quickly now. So during the Pleistocene, so the Ice Age, Ireland would have kind of seesawed from being a frozen hellscape with the kind of glaciers and looking very much like the Arctic of today to being an open grassy habitat, a little bit like what you see on the photo on the screen there. Uh, during warmer spells, this kind of grassy habitat that you see would have been home to an, actually, an absolutely amazing collection of creatures. And um, this would include some very surprising animals, um, including some that would have looked more at home in Africa today and in the Arctic. They would have been living in Ireland in places like Cork and Waterford around 35,000 years ago. And these creatures would have actually shared the plains of Ireland with some prehistoric animals that have since gone extinct. So what kind of creatures were they? Well, this is probably the most famous creature that lived in Ireland during the Ice Age. So this is the giant Irish deer. Uh, what do we know about the giant Irish deer? Well, it had the largest antlers of any deer that ever lived. So they would have stretched about 3.6 meters uh, from tip to tip. So basically an adult human could probably lie across the antlers twice. That's how enormous they were. And if anyone has been to the Natural History Museum in Dublin, it's one of the, it's an amazing, awesome sight when you walk in the front door and you see uh, the remains of two stags with their huge, huge antlers. So really, really incredible. Uh, the stags would have weighed up to 600 kilograms. So to put that in context, that puts them about three times larger than the red deer stags that you'll find in Killarney today. So just absolutely massive creatures. So the remains of uh, the giant Irish deer have been found across the country, but especially in uh, Ballybita Bog up in the Dublin mountains, actually not that far from Ennis Kerry, um, which has been a really, really productive site for this. Um, you know, dozens and dozens of them have been excavated from that one site um, over the years. What do we know about how this animal behaved? Well, it was uh, thought to have been an open plains creature, which makes sense because this would have been the habitat that would have predominated in Ireland at that time. Uh, it would have uh, eaten a lot of grass. Uh, we know this from the broad muzzle that it had. It was uh, basically a grazer. It was a highly cursorial deer, so it was built for a kind of open plains running lifestyle. Um, it's thought that like modern deer, they would have spent much of the year in uh, segregated herds. So uh, males in, in would have lived separately to females. And it's thought that the males graze in more lowland kind of uh, lush habitat close to lakes. And this is thought to explain why a lot of the remains of the giant stags are actually found in lakes and why stags are actually more often to be found than, than those because a lot of the remains have been found in prehistoric lakes that subsequently became bogs, which is why they were excavated from bogs. Um, as big as the giant Irish deer were, they weren't actually the biggest animal that we know to have lived in Ireland during the Ice Age, and that was the woolly mammoth was even bigger, in fact, much bigger. Uh, so what do we know about the woolly mammoth? Well, well, the undisputed icon of the Ice Age, probably one of the most famous creatures from prehistory, and an absolute uh, behemoth as well, would have been about the size of a modern elephant. So you're talking about three meters at the shoulder and with large bulls weighing in at about six tons. Uh, the remains of mammoths have been found across the country in places like Shandon Cave in County Waterford and Castlepoo Cave in County Cork. Uh, the mammoth that was found in Shandon Cave is thought to have actually fallen th uh, into the cave, so it was walking along, uh, minding its business, and then the roof of the cave actually collapsed and the mammoth fell in, which is why the, uh, the bones of the mammoth were found there. Uh, the remains in Castlepoo Cave, it's, that was probably not the case. They might have actually been brought in by uh, predators that had butchered a dead mammoth, which we'll get on to slightly later on. 
Uh, the woolly mammoth was incredibly well adapted for its Ice Age environment. So um, when we think of modern elephants, we think obviously of the enormous ears that they have. And the reason that why elephants today have huge ears is to help them lose heat. So with big ears, they kind of diffuse the heat um, out of the animal's body. The woolly mammoth had the opposite because it lived in a very cold environment. It had much smaller ears and a shorter tail and a shorter trunk. So smaller extremities would have been less exposed to the cold and emitted much less body heat to help it keep it contained within the body. Um, they would have had a very dense coat. So you're talking of an outer layer of nearly a meter long and then a much denser under layer of about eight to 10 centimeters long. And then a very thick layer of fat underneath the skin as well to help keep them insulated. They even had an antifreeze agent in their blood, so to, to help keep their blood oxygenated in freezing temperatures. So they would have been incredibly well adapted to their harsh ice age environment. Um, their tusks could grow well over three meters long, so they had absolutely enormous tusks, tusks. And in fact, mammoth ivory was still being traded for thousands of years after they became extinct. It's thought that they lived in matriarchal herds, much like elephants do today. So uh, if anything, if any of you know anything about modern elephant behavior and um, the way elephant families are structured, it's primarily females uh, that are related to each other. So sisters, uh, mothers, daughters, aunts and nieces all living together in the one herd. And, and this herd is led by a matriarch who usually would have been the eldest uh, member of the herd and bulls would have left their herd at adolescence and kind of struck out on their own, they would have lived a much more solitary existence. And the fossil record for mammoths is actually thought to confirm this because uh, males, the bulls, are much more uh, overrepresented than females. About two thirds of mammoth remains found um, across their range were actually of uh, males rather than females. And one of the reasons it's thought for this is that um, because the female uh, mammoths were led by their matriarch who would have been very, very knowledgeable, would have had a huge amount of experience they were able to avoid things like um, natural traps like bogs, uh, slippery rivers, basically any kind of dangers, uh, any pitfalls that they could have fallen into. Whereas the bulls, especially the young bulls that had just left their families were much um, more inclined to fall foul to things like this. And that's why their remains are much more likely to be found today. So as well as the giant deer and the mammoths, uh, we also had a lot of kind of smaller herbivores in Ireland at this time, but still very impressive in and of themselves. Reindeer fossils are very well known from Ice Age sites around Ireland. They've been found all across the country in places like Waterford, in Sligo, and also in County Cork. Uh, much rare, rarer was, were remains of creatures like the musk ox, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, like the woolly mammoth, it had a very dense coat to help it survive in its harsh Ice Age environment. Uh, the only musk ox remains in Ireland have been found in County Antrim, so probably wasn't as common, but we still know that they were here uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, some of the other Ice Age herbivores we had in Ireland uh, were creatures like the wild horse. So the picture on the top right hand corner there is actually what's called the Chevalsky's horse, which is the last species of truly wild horse that we have. And this probably is a close approximation of what Ireland's wild horses might have looked like uh, we're used to horses today being very kind of tall, uh, kind of graceful, regal creatures. But the truth is that prehistoric horses that haven't been domesticated and bred uh, probably would have been quite a lot shorter, had a proportionally much bigger head, would have looked quite a lot scruffier and quite a lot duller in their, in, in their coat, just like the creature you see here. And as well as all of these big grazers, the mammoths, the horses, the giant deer, we also had some smaller herbivores as well. So we had creatures like lemmings, uh, which are a type of rodent that you can see at the bottom right hand that were very well adapted for living in Arctic conditions, which they still do today. And amazingly, we also had the Irish hare, which is one of the oldest um, creatures that we know to inhabit Ireland. We, the Irish hares that we have today are actually a unique subspecies to this island, and um, they would have actually lived in Ireland during the Ice Age, so they would have shared the plains with giant deer, which is just incredible. So with all of these herbivores, it should come as no surprise that we had uh, predators in Ireland during the Ice Age as well. Amazingly, we actually had hyenas. It's, it's incredible when you think of hyenas now, you think of the Serengeti and you think of places like the Masai Mara. But we, uh, thanks to an incomplete skull that was found in Castle Pooh Cave in County Cork, we know that we had uh, spotted hyenas that would have been hunting and scavenging from the remains of mammoths and giant deer uh, on the plains of Munster 35,000 years ago, which would have been absolutely incredible to have seen. Uh, probably more familiar would have been creatures like the brown bear. So we actually had brown bears long after the Ice Age in Ireland, but they certainly lived here uh, during the Pleistocene as well, when the weather allowed them to do so. 
Uh, back then, you also had creatures like the grey wolf, which also, like the brown bear, survived in Ireland and in Europe for thousands of years after the Ice Age ended. Back then, they would have hunted uh, reindeer on the grassy plains of Ireland, much as they still do in Arctic regions of today. And in their shadow, we would have had smaller uh, creatures, smaller carnivores like the Arctic fox and also the Irish stoat. So the Irish stoat, like the Irish hare, is its own uh, separate um, race, which is distinct from stoats found elsewhere. The Irish stoat, I believe, is also found in on the Isle of Man. So it's not completely unique to Ireland, but still a very um, genetically quite distinct from the, their counterparts on the continent, which indicates that they've been here a long time. And the evidence suggests that they were here um, during you know thousands of years ago when we had creatures like uh, reindeer and even giant Irish deer grazing the, the grasslands of Ireland. So what happened to all of these incredible Ice Age creatures? Well, as the Ice Age came to an end, so around 11,700 years ago, many of the so-called mega beasts of the Ice Age, the mammoths, and uh, not just mammoths, but things like the saber-toothed cats, short-faced bears, many, many others, all of them started to go extinct. Um, it's likely that human hunting played a part in this. It's known that people would have hunted mammoths and climate change was probably an even bigger factor. So with the war gradual warming of the climate, you would have seen changes to the habitat that creatures like mammoths would have depended upon. Um, so around 10,000 years ago, mammoths largely went extinct across most of their range. The very last ones clung on, in, on a tiny island off the coast of Alaska until around 4,000 years ago, um, but they would have been a, a tiny population they actually would have, have shrunk down in size. They would have been much smaller than the mammoths we had here because they didn't have enough food to sustain big bodies on such a tiny island. Our last giant Irish deer died out around 10,600 years ago. Um, the giant Irish deer wasn't unique to Ireland. It was found all over Europe, but because uh, the remains from Ireland are so, um, so numerous and so complete, it's why it's called the giant Irish deer. But they actually disappeared from here quite a lot earlier than they did elsewhere. The last ones on Earth went extinct around 7,000 years ago. So they lasted um, probably more than 3,000 years uh, longer than they did uh, after they became extinct in Ireland. So just the very last section then I'm just going to talk to you about is the time since the arrival of humans. So um, one of the amazing things about this whole field is that new discoveries are being made all the time. So just this year, a reindeer bone from Casapu Cave in County Cork was uh, found that actually had scratch marks that were left by human hunters. And the bone itself dated from around to around 33,000 years ago. And this was an absolute bombshell because before this, it was thought that the first people arrived in Ireland around 12 and a half thousand years ago. So this one find actually pushed back the date for human arrival in Ireland by more than 20,000 years. Uh, what do we know about these people? Not a whole lot, to be honest with you. They would have been we know obviously that they hunted reindeer uh, for meat, so they probably would have been nomadic uh, following reindeer across uh, herds of reindeer across the plains of Ice Age Europe. That would have been their main sustenance. And as the, but we do know a lot more about what the impact of humans was after the Ice Age ended in Ireland. And that's kind of the main focus of the third part of the book, really the how life in the country developed since the arrival of man and the impacts we've had on the different habitats and the animals that lived in them. What kind of habitats were they? So within around 2000 years of the Ice Age coming to an end, Ireland actually became, went from being a very open, uh, almost treeless landscape dominated by grass to being very, very heavily forested. Uh, up to 80% of Ireland was covered in forests. And um, uh, the old saying was that from Malin to Mizzen, so from Donegal to Kerry, just would have been a, basically a huge belt of um, temperate rainforest really. Uh, it's, it's said that a squirrel could cross from almost from coast to coast without coming down to the ground, which just shows how extensive Ireland's forests were before they were cleared away. Uh, these forests would have provided rich pickings for Stone Age hunters, as well as a menagerie of different birds and animals. Uh, these are some of the animals that we, we used to have in our forest uh, back then. So the Tempers Rainforest of Ireland would have been home to the red deer that you can still find in Killarney National Park today, uh, which is obviously you can see in the top right hand corner there. Um, it's an incredible spectacle if you can get down in late September, early October. I would highly recommend this. It's uh, probably one of the great wildlife spectacles that we still have left in Ireland, so definitely worth, worth checking out. Um, as well as the red deer, we also would have had some very formidable creatures that we still don't have in Ireland today. So uh, brown bears and grey wolves would have survived the Ice Age. We also would have had wild boars uh, ruffling through the undergrowth and even, uh, even lynx as well. So we would have had our own um, 
not quite big cat, but uh, maybe medium cat would probably be the best way to, to describe it. Now, uh, since people arrived, obviously they brought uh, new technological developments and probably one of the biggest um, developments that would have happened in Ireland that affected wildlife and affected people was the onset of farming. So farming first arrived in Ireland at least 6,000 years ago, and this would have a huge impact not only on the landscape, but on the people as well. So, I mean, as you can imagine, over that time, there's been scarcely a square kilometre of Ireland that hasn't been grazed or cultivated at one point. And in fact, uh, Irish people are actually the most lactose tolerant people in the world, which I thought was an interesting fact. It just shows how um, agriculture has had such a massive and all pervasive impact on our genetics and on our landscapes as well and the creatures that inhabit them. So farming would create an ideal habitat for species that thrive in more open habitats. Um, so that would include, include things like a lot of ground nesting birds that actually prefer open habitats because it lets them spot predators more easily. And um, these would include birds like the corncrake, which you can see in the top right there. Uh, it used to be a very, very common bird in Ireland. Um, very unique sound, arguably an ugly sound, but um, certainly a very interesting creature in and of itself. Uh, one's a very common summer visitor across Ireland. Uh, farming would have been also a uh, created great habitat for creatures like yellow hammers, which you can see at the bottom right there, which feed on things like spilt grain. So they're very heavily uh, influenced by things like cereal farming, as well as the gray partridge, which was uh, an iconic farmland bird across much of Ireland for, for a very long time. So some of the other kind of indigenous habitat that developed after the ice age were kind of the, the bogs. And of course, Ireland, um, so there are two types of bogs that you can find in Ireland today, which are the blanket bog and the raised bog. Uh, blanket bogs are the type that you find most often in upland or in very, very waterlogged conditions. So typically in mountainous areas and also along the west coast. Ireland, even though it's such a tiny island, actually has about 8% of the total blanket bog in the whole world. So we're a very, very important uh, 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 nation in terms of this particular type of habitat. Um, Ireland's, in terms of creatures that used to live in our upland areas, one of the top predators was, of course, the golden eagle, um, you know, which left its, its, its um, legacy in terms of uh, names. You find uh, names in Irish, you know, that correspond to eagle's nest in mountainous areas across the country, which just shows that they used to be inhabited by golden eagles before they were tragically uh, wiped out. Uh, today, our upland areas are still home to creatures like Sika and hybrid deer, like the, the one you see on the screen there. Uh, it was one that I photographed just above Glendalough. A lot of the deer in Wicklow are kind of of mixed stock, uh, red deer, seeker deer. The seeker deer are not native to Ireland, as a lot of you probably know. They're originally from Japan, but they were introduced in the middle of the 1800s to Powers Court, subsequently escaped, and have since kind of mingled with the local red deer. So the predominant deer, if we have in the Wicklow Mountains, would really have um, mixed seeker, red deer, oh, red deer ancestry. Also important in the uplands, we have a look for birds like the red grouse, which is very, very heavily dependent upon heather. So um, they're a, another bird, that uh, another quite unusual bird that you will find in the uplands, as well as the wheat ear, which is a beautiful summer migrant. Um, as in spring, you can see them in places along like Wicklow Harbour, because they'll be migrating, uh, having just arrived from their wintering grounds in Africa, and they'll be making their way to the uplands to breed. The other type of bog we have in Ireland is called a uh, raised bog. So raised bogs uh, are so-called because they formed, uh, typically they're, they're, you find raised bogs more often in the Midlands and they date back from the very end of the last ice age. So when the glaciers were retreating, they would have left a lot of lakes in their wake that filled up with vegetation, filled up with mosses that subsequently started to spill out over the lake, which is why it's called a raised bog and then slowly spread out across the landscape. And the, because of this, because they date back from the, from the end of the Ice Age, the raised bogs in Ireland are actually some of the oldest living ecosystems in the world, which makes them incredibly unique and very, very important that we try to preserve them. Uh, they're also home to some of our most unique wildlife, such as our carnivorous plants, like the sundew, which you can see in the top right-hand corner there. Uh, one of the reasons why carnivorous plants are found in bogs is because the, the lack of nutrients in the soil probably forced them to evolve carnivory in order to supplement the nutrition they could get from the soil. So the insects that they can catch and digest would have given them an extra, an extra boost of nutrition. Um, raised bogs, again, because of a lack of trees, uh, typically a very open habitat. This makes them uh, perfect for ground nesting birds, uh, such as the curlew, uh, which is um, a wader with a very long decurved beak, which um, the plight of the curlew has been very well publicized over the last few years. They're in 
a great decline and Ireland, a lot of Ireland's remaining curly would breed on raised bogs uh, across the country. In the past, we would have had much, much bigger birds like the crane, which you can see in the bottom uh, photo there. Uh, cranes um, is a bird that crane is a bird that people sometimes get confused about in an Irish context because uh, the word crane is sometimes used to describe the grey heron, but the actual crane was a much different bird and would have been much, much bigger. It would have absolutely dwarfed a grey heron, so it would have been absolutely spectacular to have seen on the bogs of Ireland hundreds of years ago. So what happened in Ireland, um, really from the, from the Middle Ages on, from the arrival of the Vikings, you would have seen a very slow trend towards urbanization that started to accelerate um, in more recent times. And um, so uh, urban areas are actually, while they're often thought of as kind of ecological dead zones, they're actually very, very important for wildlife. And uh, certain species, such as the red fox is a good example, have adopted, adapted very, very well to urban living. Um, Foxes actually can live at higher densities in urban areas. They need smaller territories because the pickings are so rich for them. So um, it just goes to show that uh, not all creatures are excluded from urban environments. Um, the same is true actually for quite a lot of birds. So creatures like blackbirds can have been shown to breed earlier in, in urban areas uh, than they do in, country, in the countryside. And they can breed at higher densities because they can find a higher prevalence of food in things like gardens, for example. Uh, provide rich pickings for birds like blackbirds that like to pull worms from the soil, eat things like uh, fallen apples and fruit. Um, you also have creatures like the swift, which you can see at the bottom right hand corner. Um, swifts are birds that actually, um, urban living initially was uh, very, very uh, beneficial for them because they nested in the sockets of the old Georgian buildings you found in places like Dublin. And these provided, because, because swifts uh, actually found it really difficult to land on branches and they can't build a conventional less the way something like a blackbird can. They um, uh, much prefer having something uh, like a loft they can land onto. So urban, urban living actually was very, very good for, for birds such as swifts. Uh, unfortunately, I have to come to a little bit of a sad note now. So just kind of reflecting very quickly before we close on what we've lost in Ireland uh, since the arrival of man. Um, Ireland is now one of the least forested countries in Europe. So we've gone from around 80% forest cover to less than 2% native forest cover, which is an absolutely enormous decline. It just shows the degree of the forest clearances that happened in Ireland over the centuries. Uh, the brown bear went extinct around 3000 years ago. Uh, it's thought that they were hunted to extinction by ancient farmers, probably to protect themselves as well as their livestock. Excuse me. And the gray wolf actually lasted in Ireland much, much later only going to extinction in the late 1700s. And um, there were a few different reasons for this. Uh, one of the main reasons was one was habitat loss, another was active persecution. So uh, in Ireland, wolves actually uh, thrived for a lot longer than they did in Britain. But with um, the other things like the Cromwellian conquest in the 1600s, and um, with the arrival of uh, a lot more uh, English and Scottish planters into Ireland, they were very alarmed to see how prevalent they were here because uh, wolves were actually held in quite high esteem by the native Irish. They weren't exterminated by them, but that started to change from the 1600s on. They were persecuted much more heavily until the very last one was killed in Mount Leinster, County Carlow, around 17, in the year 1786. Um, in terms of the animals that have suffered the most since humans arrived, probably birds of prey is the group of animals that have suffered the most in Ireland. So aside from owls, we used to have 12 breeding birds of prey in Ireland. And seven of those were actually wiped out by human persecution, by things like shooting and systematic poisoning, and um, just shows the degree of persecution that they underwent. So uh, really, really tragic. All told, it's thought around 120 species of plant and animal, animal have become extinct as a result of the actions of, of people in Ireland. Um, of all of those, this is probably the most noteworthy. This is called the Great Auk. So the Great Auk was a large flightless seabird um, that has been extinct, not just in Ireland, but extinct in the whole world since the 1800s. And um, it was actually found all around the Irish, all around our coast. And it's likely to have bred in Ireland, probably in places like the Kira Islands off the coast of County Wexford. It looks very much like a penguin, but it's not a penguin at all. It's not related to them in the slightest. It's much more related to birds like guillemots and razorbills, especially, which you can see at places like Wicklow Head and Bray Head. Um, it evolved towards flightlessness to make it better in the water. So 
and basically it has a very it had a very very hydrodynamic shape but in order to develop this it basically had to sacrifice the ability to fly which made it very very at risk when it came ashore to predation and also to hunting by people which ultimately was its downfall um, over tongue over hunting took a very devastating toll and uh, the ox would have been hunted for their feathers were using things like pillows they were also used um, for ladies fashion and things like hats and stuff like that so they were persecuted very they were hunted extremely heavily uh, during the 17 and 1800s people really didn't understand concepts like extinction it was really unfathomable that a creature that had been so numerous could eventually go extinct but extinct they did go so from the middle of the 1800s uh, the last great hawks were, were gone uh, the last confirmed Irish great auk was captured off Ballymacaw County Waterford in 1834. This is the bird you see on your screen now. Um, it's thought to be the only, there are only 78 stuffed great auks left in museum collections around the world. This one is in Trinity College in Dublin and it holds the distinction of being uh, the only great auk that's actually in juvenile plumage. So that's, that explains, as you can see, it's in much more mottled browns and, and whites. The adults would have had a very striking black and white plumage. Uh, in terms of the, uh, of the some of the other creatures that are in trouble, ground nesting birds in Ireland, such as the curlew, have um, declined severely for due to things like habitat loss, changing farming practices have taken, unfortunately, taking an enormous toll. Um, birds like the corncrake, for instance, the transition from hay making to uh, silage cutting uh, necessitated much earlier harvesting of grass, uh, which coincided with the corncrake's breeding season. So this led to destruction of eggs, chicks, and nests. Uh, which subsequently saw their decline across much of Ireland, particularly in places where modern farming has taken hold. Uh, you'll probably know that corn crakes now only really survive in remote outposts on the west coast. And typically these are places where the soil is too shallow or too rocky to allow for modern har farming with combine harvesters and such. Even species that once thrived in urban areas are sadly in decline now. Swifts are a prime example of this. Uh, one of the reasons for this is believed to be the fact that um, Modern buildings don't actually have the kind of soffits that swifts can fly into and land and take off from and build their nests in. So a shortage of nest sites in much more modern, modern uh, refurbished structures is affecting them. All told, it's thought around 300 species are now actually threatened with extinction in Ireland to some degree or another. I'd like to try and end on a positive note, and then um, this again is a story that not only Ireland can be proud of, but uh, County Wicklow can be very proud of as well. We've seen some very successful reintroductions of species into Ireland, such as the red kite and uh, in County Wicklow, which I'm sure many of you have seen in places like Avoca and Wicklow Town. Uh, they're, they're all over the place now and it's just wonderful to see. We've also had the white-tailed eagle reintroduced into County Kerry. So when I said earlier that uh, we lost seven species of, seven breeding species of bird of prey in Ireland, uh, six of those are actually breeding in Ireland again, which is incredible. Uh, the only outlier to that is actually the osprey, which we get, we do get them on uh, passage and places like Broadlock. They haven't bred again in Ireland yet, but hopefully they will uh, in the near future. Who knows? Another Wicklow success story, of course, is the great spotted woodpecker. Uh, so this was completely extinct. It wasn't reintroduced. It recolonized Ireland of its own accord. And Wicklow is now actually the stronghold, or one of the strongholds anyway, for the great, this species in Ireland, uh, which is really, really wonderful, really wonderful. In fact, I think... Um, the library is actually organizing a talk by Declan Murphy um, over the next couple of weeks, and he has written a very, very highly regarded book about uh, great spotted woodpeckers. So uh, that one would probably definitely be worth checking out. Um, even uh, some of our giant creatures that we lost could be on the cusp of making a return. So uh, it's been confirmed that uh, cranes, uh, this is really exciting news, have nested or have rather have been seen in nesting habitat, sorry, in the Midlands. So it's hoped now that after an absence of up to 300 years, they could be finally on their verge of making a return. And uh, who knows, we might even have nesting cranes in Ireland again, which would be just incredible. And um, other species that have been in trouble, such as the red squirrel are starting to make a comeback. And this is actually held by uh, the comeback of another species, which is called the pine marten. So the pine marten is kind of like a, a type of a weasel that um, lives in trees typically, it would hunt squirrels and um, they introduce a grey squirrel, which is one of the reasons for the red squirrel going into decline. So the grey squirrel was introduced into Ireland from North America and due to competition, our native red squirrel started to decline. But because the grey squirrel is bigger and heavier than the red squirrel, it's easier for the pine markets to catch. 
So this is not only good for the pine martins, it's also good for the red squirrels as well. This is thought to be one of the reasons why red squirrels are starting to make a comeback, which is great to see. It's also good to see that public awareness is at an all time high. Uh, people are realizing that conservation isn't just something that happens far away. It's something we can all play a part in, um, whether it's through planting wildflowers, planting native trees like hawthorn or rowans, um, building a pond in your back garden. There's something all of us can do to help, which is wonderful. Very, very quickly then, because I've probably talked enough and taken up enough of your time on this wonderful evening, and um, this lovely bright evening. Um, I just wanted to talk about a sort of new frontier in the field of conservation, which is de-extinction, which is a, a concept that's kind of really reared its head over the last couple of years. Quite a controversial field, and uh, one that's still very much up in the air, but a very, very exciting development nonetheless. So what does de-extinction mean? Well, it means with advances in genetic technology, it's hoped that one day, um, species that were completely extinct, such as the woolly mammoth and the grey hawk, could actually be uh, resurrected and could be eventually uh, have their numbers repopulated and reintroduced back into the wild. Probably not in Ireland. Uh, we don't have the habitat for woolly mammoths anymore, but the hope is to reintroduce them into somewhere like Siberia, where the kind of steppe grassland habitat is much as it was during the end of the last ice age. This could be an exciting new uh, field in the uh, a new uh, frontier, rather in the field of conservation. And um, hopefully, it could be used to help kind of augment uh, the conservation efforts that are already happening around the world, uh, bring back species that have been made extinct by human uh, human interference, and thereby helping to refill the kind of places in the ecosystem that have subsequently been uh, that are now going unfilled as a result of those species uh, becoming extinct. And um, with that, uh, that's basically it. So thank you so much for uh, letting me speak to you. I hope you found it somewhat interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, if anyone has uh, questions or thoughts, I'd be, I'd be happy to hear them and I'll answer them as best I can. Thank you so much, Connor. You've done a, an amazing feat of uh, taking us through 500 million years of, of, of Ireland's history uh, in such a quick time. So thanks a million for that. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to stop the recording and as uh, Connor said, we'll open up uh, for questions.